Okay, good. Thank you, Geraldine, and thank you, Jen. Okay, so um, so Abaye sends Abaye sends this what seems to be a very modest gift. Right before we had the gift was a nice big chunk of brisket and uh, and and some wine. Um, and according to the Yerushalmi, it was first a chunk and then it became the whole animal. So big, big impressive kinds of gifts. And now what Rab, what what uh, what Rabba is saying uh, is sending. Um, is some dates and a cup of flour. And so the, the roasted wheat, okay, it's very nice. It's a kind of, but it's a, but it's a very humble kind of gift. So Abaye uh, is seeming to take him to task and saying, this is, come on, you're, you're, the, you're you know, part of the, of the aristoc you know, aristocratic layer of, of, of the rabbis. What are you doing here? You, you should be sending out much more uh, uh, gracious uh, and expensive gifts. Okay, so now we're back to uh, the Talmud. Abai said to Rabba, Mari will now say about you, if, the, oh, I read this. Where am I? No, no, that's uh, um, no, the yeah. No, go if a peasant becomes right in the middle. Mari Barmar sent if back to peasant, Rabba. If a peasant becomes a king, does he not take the basket which he used to feed his animals down off his neck? Mari Barmar sent back to Rabba a basket filled with ginger and a cup filled with long peppers. Abai said, Master, Rabba will now say, I sent him sweet foods and he sends me back bitter ones. Okay. So Abaye is caught in the middle and we'll, we'll continue with Abaye in a second. He's the, the, uh, you know, the go-between and he's reflecting what he thinks these uh, uh, gifts are actually encoding, right? There's, there's a kind of a, um, you know, a message it, you know, you know, Freud, you know, said sometimes a, a cup of peppers is not just a cup of peppers. It, it means something. So uh, um, Abaye first gives commentary on what uh, he thinks Rabba did. And now he's an understanding uh, Mari Barmar to be say, to being annoyed, right? Like he sends back to, uh, to, uh, to Rabba, oh, thanks very much for your measly gift you know so let me let me do you one better and uh, I'm gonna send you stuff that's that's uh, bitter and and uh, and hard to eat um, to to you know theoretically I'm sending you you know food gifts that would fulfill the mitzvah of uh, of sending uh, uh, food portions to my friend but the food portions I'm sending to my friend are uh, pretty pungent pretty, uh, hard to uh, um, to eat, so it's it's a, a gift, but with a little, you know, uh, a sting to it. Okay, here we keep going. More about the same incident. Abaye said, "When I left the master's Rabba's house to go to Mari, I was full. Yet when I arrived there." They brought me 60 plates with 60 types of cooked food. And I ate 60 pieces, one of each of them. The last dish they gave me, they called pot roast. And after eating it, I wanted to eat the plate. Abayi commented on this incident. This is illustrative of what people say. A poor person does not know when he is hungry. Alternatively, it bears out this popular saying, room can always be found in one's stomach for sweet things. Okay, so um, now we get the, the go-between guy, his story, right? We've seen the two uh, gifts uh, that were sent uh, back and forth between the two um, prominent sages. And now we, Abaye says, meanwhile, I was the messenger. Let me tell you how it was for me. And he was greeted in uh, the home of uh, Mari Barmar. 
um, with lavish, lavish welcome. And he was given, you know, the most amazing banquet uh, of all kinds of foods. And uh, we get, you know, this kind of like uh, exaggerated 60 times 60 times 60. And I had, and I, and I just, it was amazing. I couldn't stop tasting everything. The open, you know, bar was just, the salad bar was, was amazing. Then this is like, uh, you know, those, those uh, smorgasbords that they have, you know, at the, which are so much better than the, than the real meal itself. And he's having uh, he's having a, a ball. He's and and it was just unbelievable. Just had such a great uh, meal, which of course, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, contrasts to these little symbolic food gifts that um, that Rabba gave to uh, Mari and that Mari gave uh, to Rabba. Right, and that's that's part of the idea. You, you, your your point is not to give the person in a gigantic uh, array of foodstuffs. It's just to be a, a gift of some, uh, you know, a, a nice little treat. Um, so here is Abaye, and he's being stuffed to the gills by this amazingly terrific uh, menu of stuff. And uh, we we apparently pot roast was exotic at that time. Now, uh, now pot roast is considered a, a pretty, pretty run-of-the-mill kind of uh, food, but uh, pretty, pretty uh, uh, good. He liked this. He likes this, and uh, and then he draws two uh, conclusions. Right? He says, you know, that whole experience of mine, we're on seven B one, the right-hand column, the top. So he says, this is a, there's a popular saying that this was a great illustration of, right? So he says that there's, there's a popular saying that a poor person doesn't even know that they're hungry. And right? why is that? Why not? Yeah, Bill. Presumably because they, they, they have very little to eat anyway, uh, it's hard for them to tell when they're, really, when they're really hungry. They're hungry all the time. That's it. They're hungry all the time. When we talk about being hungry, it's because we are privileged to, you know, to have uh, good, good, good food. We've got full refrigerators. Um, we can eat anytime we want. Um, so to say that you're hungry is like to feel all of a sudden that that lack. But um, the poor people are always hungry. So there's no difference. Like it, there's not saying, "Oh, I really feel hungry now." You're always feeling hungry. So there's no extra lack that you that you that you feel. So when he didn't realize um, how much he could scarf down, um, here he was given, um, you know, the opportunity to eat to his heart's content, and he surprised himself by how uh, how much uh, he was able to uh, uh, to put away. So we learned something about Abaye. What do we learn about Abaye? There's a couple of things we can learn about Abaye. Right? One thing is he's applying this Why? saying to he's applying this saying to himself. Therefore, if this saying applies to him, that means that he is a poor person. Right? So again, what links a couple of these stories together, the story that we had back on 7A4, the, at the end of uh, the bottom of, of the first uh, side of the page. And then going over into this, now we're up onto the, onto the next side. Not only are we talking about the same kind of practice of giving food gifts for Purim, that's one link. And we're talking about sages giving food gifts to other sages, that's another common denominator. But we also have this underlying recognition that numerous uh, sages were poor. Right, that even though they, they were part of a, of a spiritual and intellectual elite, socially speaking, they really were not well off. They, they were hungry. They were not, uh, um, you know, they weren't, they weren't successful economically. Um, and this, of course, as I said, um, is, is uh, you know, is a reflection on the realities of that time. Um, being a rabbi was not a paid position per se, 
and uh, you had to, uh, you know, either get some kind of administrative government appointed post to get a little bit of, of, of uh, money as a rabbi, or you had to go out and figure out some other way to make a living, uh, be, a, be a shoemaker, uh, be a blacksmith, um, uh, you know, uh, whatever. So here we have um, two cases, Rabbi Hoshaya, one of the major, major, major early uh, uh, Talmudic, Mishnahic Talmudic sages, the transition generation. And then you have Abaye, who of course becomes one of the key figures in the Babylonian Talmud. He is one of the most frequently cited sages in the Babylonian Talmud. And we have here, it seems like this is probably early in his career when he's, when he's you know, it's just helping out with these major uh, 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 figures and doing errands for them. This is called Shimush Talmidei Chachamim, to minister to the needs of the sages, um, which uh, the sages uh, put great stock in. And you could say that's a kind of a self-serving uh, idea, but they believe that that's the way you learn to be a sage. This is the idea of being an apprentice, right? How do you, how do you learn a, a, you know, a, a trade, a skill, a craft? You learn by just doing everything um, that, your, that your master asks you to do. And that of course is what the, ra the word rabbi means. It means that's my master. So my master tells me to, you know, to get him a cup of coffee, I get him a cup of coffee. My master tells me to, uh, you know, to go, uh, uh, you know, whatever, you know, take, uh, take the, the dog for a walk. I listen to her and I take the dog for a walk. So is that going back to stuff that we, that we looked a little bit at, at uh, uh, in, in Pirkei Avot uh, the, earlier this morning? Is that Torah? Is that really Torah? And the answer is in the broadest sense it is. How to, to, how to live a fully encompassing, uh, a life that's fully encompassed by Torah, you learn from, uh, from the sages the masters and you imbibe it, you, you, you suck it in, you know, you, you, you take it in almost by osmosis. Um, a cousin of mine was a close student of Rab Zalman, Shach de Shalomi, and uh, very, very, uh, you know, a PhD, a, a, a scholar. Um, and uh, she said, I go to Rab Zalman, she was quoting other earlier sayings to the same effect, I got Rab Zalman to see how he ties his shoelaces. That's, that's why I hang out with, with, um, with my master, just to see that kind of simple, how does that person go about life? So uh, um, here's Abaye running errands. In this case, he's running errands that are a mitzvah. Um, and uh, we, we notice from this particular version of the story, he's not, you know, a successful, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, person in terms of his uh, uh, making a living. He's a poor person too. And here he actually has the meal of his life. By, by doing a simple errand, uh, he ends up uh, uh, benefiting tremendously. Um, the second version um, is a different saying. Right? Room can always be found in one's stomach for sweet things. Okay, what does that, what does that version um, change for us? Takes away everything that I just said. Maybe Abaye wasn't poor. Maybe Abaye was, uh, you know, always had plenty to, of food to eat. It's just this was so delicious, even though he was really not hungry. You're always. Uh, you know, ready to eat, you know, another piece of dessert, another dainty, another, you know, dish that has some tremendous uh, flavoring to it. Um, so it's a very, it's almost the opposite kind of saying from the first one. The first one, you know, says that, that this is just plain hunger that was going on here. And the second is no, no hunger whatsoever. This is about gourmet delights, right? Okay. Um, any other comments? We continue. The Gomorrah relates. Abaye Bar Avin, Abaye Bar Avin and Rab Hanina 
Bar Aven exchanged their Purim feasts with one another. Rava said, one is obligated to become intoxicated with wine on Purim until one does not know the difference between cursed is Haman and blessed is Mordecai. Right. So let's well, let's let's uh, stop before we go into Rava's uh, discussion. Um, we have this uh, little uh, freestanding uh, uh, point, right? That these two people, who maybe were brothers, um, used to machlefesu uh, dataihu um, lahadadi. Um, they would exchange their Purim feasts with one another. So what this means is, is that we're not talking about matanot levyonim, gifts to the poor. We're not talking about mishloach manot, shalach manas. We're not talking about giving a, a little uh, food uh, bag to your friend. We're talking about another mitzvah of Purim. The mitzvah that this is, is suda, a real feast, a real meal, that you're supposed to have a meal on Purim, a Purim suda. And that mitzvah is uh, uh, um, incumbent upon everyone on the day of Purim, not the night of Purim, but the next day, right? Uh, so you read Megillah at night, and then the next day um, we send gifts to each other, we give uh, uh, gifts to the poor, and we're supposed to have a, uh, a festive meal together. So this is one of the things that uh, are mentioned again in uh, the Megillah, and which turn Purim into a very, very uh, high grade um, festival, right? Because these are the, this mitzvah of having a su'uda, that's a mitzvah that applies to Shabbat and festivals. And we take that, uh, that uh, mitzvah and we apply it to Purim as well. So here we have these two uh, sages who would exchange feasts with, each, with one another. So what does that mean? They would apparently um, either give each other a feast or something else. We're gonna have a bunch of, of, uh, of uh, um, possibilities in, uh, in note number eight, I think, yes? Note number eight. Um, Barrel. One provided the meal one year, the other the next, Rashi. With this, the Gemara teaches that it is better to eat the Purim meal in the house of a friend than to eat in one's own home alone. Eating together with friends enhances one ha one's happiness and joy. Other commentators? Other commentators explain that they literally exchange the food of their feasts. Abaye Rav Hanina did not have enough food for both the mitzvah of sending portions and their Purim feasts by exchanging meals with each other. They fulfilled the mitzvah of sending portions and at the same time had food for their feasts. Okay, so this ties us back up then with the story that we began with. Can you fulfill two mitzvot with one act, right? Um, but what they did was they basically just paid for each other's meal. Um, we used to do that in yeshiva on Purim morning. Uh, we were after, after we had minion, um, and then we would go to the cafeteria. And usually I would buy my breakfast and, and my friend would buy their breakfast. And we'd sit down and have, and have a nice time together. But uh, you know everybody was on their own. And on Purim morning, what we would do is I would buy my friend's breakfast and my friend would buy my breakfast. And as a result, we had a su'uda together. We, we provided a meal for each other as well as providing food gifts to each other. So that's the, uh, that's, that's one, uh, that's the second interpretation. The first interpretation is they took turns. They would invite each other over. This year, it's my turn. Next year, it's your turn. Um, and uh, they knew to expect that each year they wouldn't just be on their own, but they would be uh, with uh, other people together to celebrate uh, the Purim holiday. Um, anybody, any comments? Josie. 
<clears throat> I'm hoping someday when the pandemic is over and we have a vaccine, we can go back to sharing that pleasant experience of dining together. Whether it's in somebody's home or at the synagogue, this is true. It's nicer to be with other people. But we can't right now. Right. Amen. So good. Um, we can, though, send food packages to each other. Right? And that's, uh, you know, there's, there's, you know, plenty of, of uh, businesses that, that do that all year round and, and uh, for special occasions um, and sending, you know, a, a little uh, goodie basket to somebody um, is one of the mitzvahs of Purim. It's a beautiful mitzvah of Purim. And we had back and forth this, this whole discussion. How elaborate does it have to be? In certain communities, they spend a tremendous amount on uh, these food baskets. And, and it becomes, you know, over the years, it becomes a kind of a, you know, a uh, um, competition. And, you know, and, and if last year I gave, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the gift in a, in, a, in a brown paper bag, well, I can't do that this year because I got back a, a gift that was, that was in a, in a real, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in a real decorated box. So now I'm going to have to send back another back, you know, and then, and then, oh, you sent it in a box. I've got to send it in a basket with, with colored cellophane wrapped around it and a, and a ribbon. And then the next one goes, oh, no, I, if you did that, then I have to. And unfortunately, I mean, there's something nice about it, except when it gets so, so uh, exorbitant that it becomes, um, you know, it becomes really a, a, a game um, about uh, impressing people rather than the joy of the mitzvah itself. Um, Maimonides specifically says, if you are gonna start spending money on this kind of stuff, then what should be your priority? What do you spend money on first? And he says, if you're gonna, if you're gonna allocate $1 million to, uh, to fulfill all of your Purim mitzvahs. So he says, do not spend uh, uh, the big chunk of that money on the Purim baskets that you're sending everybody and do not spend it on the meal. Spend it on gifts to the poor. It says Because that's where you spread your joy. That's where if you want Purim to be a joyous holiday, then make sure that the people that don't have anything have something to rejoice, rejoice with. So that's the priority. And guess what? You'll be able to have a nice meal, and you'll be able to send some gifts to you know to other people, um, and it's the thought that counts, right? So these are are struggles that in reality you know take place all the time. Conspicuous consumption um, became a big issue in another mitzvah, uh, the mitzvah of funerals. Um, we we know that people feel a whole mix of 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 feelings. Um, that are that are complicated. You know, you want to do right by the deceased, but then then what does it mean to do right? And if you get uh, um, you know influenced by what's happening, well, that person I, was was you know the the family you know paid for you know five thousand flowers you know to to be then. So how could we not do that if if we don't do that? We're not we're not you know respecting our dead. We're not showing that we that we love and respect the deceased. So we have to do, you know, 10,000 flowers or this one had a, had a gold casket. So how are we going to, you know, just do a simple casket? Um, and the, the rabbis, this is not a modern problem. This is a human problem. This is human psychology problem. This is a social psychology problem. So the rabbis reported that in, 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 uh, in their time, the competition for expensive funerals became unbearable and the poor could not keep up you know you can you, if you don't have a house to mortgage how are you going to get the loan to you know to spend another you know place where this happens is with weddings but uh, um, the rabbis reported that people poor people would not be able to bury their dead because they were too embarrassed to do a, a simple funeral so and that's where 
you know, the, the horror and the paradox comes really sharply into focus. So because she can't do it the way the Rothschilds or the Rockefellers did it, I'm not gonna do it at all. So instead, what did the rabbis do? Oh. They made a, they made a decision that everybody has to be buried just in a simple shroud. A simple shroud, a simple plain pine box, right? right? The whole burial has to be completely uniform at the lowest level so that the rich were not allowed, they were forbidden to uh, pay more money just because they had it to shower upon the, uh, uh, the, the, the appurtenances of the funeral. Now, that's when, uh, these are called sumptuary laws, when they make uh, uh, laws that, that uh, restrict how much money you can actually spend on stuff. That uh, is possible when you control the market when the rabbis can make a prohibition and then people have to listen to it. That doesn't exist anymore. Um, it hasn't existed in a long time. Um, so today, of course, it's a free market and today it's open again to all of that. And, and uh, you know, if you go to uh, any funeral parlor, including our, uh, you know, uh, community funeral chapel, the, the Jewish Memorial Chapel, which is uh, a chapel that we uh, work with, Shomre is a, is a participating member. And as a result, that's a not-for-profit chapel, which tries to keep costs down for people. That's a big mitzvah. That's part of this whole idea. Nevertheless, they also feel that they have to respect the wishes of the families. And if families want a, a, a fancy you know, coffin or a fancy uh, this or that or the other thing, they will respect the wishes of the family. So it's on the family then to decide how, you know, how seriously do we take this? What, what do we really consider to be uh, the right thing to do uh, for ourselves, for society, and, and, uh, and for the deceased? So these are, these are uh, uh, questions that come back to us. So here, um, we had two people who were able to economize and be also supportive and friendly to each other at the same time, right? And they exchanged the Purim feast uh, with each other, either one way or the other. Okay, now we come to one of the most famous pieces of Purim Torah um, that there are. Um, and this is a very, very provocative uh, uh, statement that uh, deals with this, uh, what's supposed to happen at the feast? What, what, what do you do at the feast? Now, even though we have a, a mitzvah to have a feast on Purim, what we don't have is what we have at, on Shabbat and Yom Tov. How do we begin a feast on Shabbat and Yom Tov? With a Kiddush. With Kiddush. Kiddush over right? wine or grape juice. So that you, you sanctify the day and you sanctify the meal. Uh, by, by taking a cup of wine and reciting blessings that celebrate the holiness of the day. That's so that, like candles though. Candles celebrate the holiness of the day also, but, but, but the, the, the candles theoretically are another thing. The candles are to add joy to the day, to add light, right? To make the, to make the, uh, um, the evening uh, brighter so that people can enjoy the holiday together. Okay. But it doesn't, it doesn't say that Shabbat is holy by virtue of lighting these candles. In Kiddush, that's what we say. Yeah. We say that this is Shabbat, is holy. Mekadesh HaShabbat, Mekadesh HaShabbat, right? Yes. Um, or with festivals, you know, Mekadesh Yisrael Vahazmanim, right? You're making these days uh, uh, holy through us. We don't do that with Purim because Purim is not a holy day. Purim is a holiday, but not a holy day. Mm -hmm. There's no holiness to Purim. There are holinesses to the mitzvot that we perform. Everything that we do as a mitzvah makes our life more holy. But Purim is not a holy day. And one of the ramifications, for instance, is you do, there are no restrictions on what you can do or not do on Purim. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not like Shabbos. It's not like Yantu. So, but... They added this idea, have a festive meal. So 
how do people have a festive meal? They're not making Kiddush. They're not drinking four cups of wine, for instance, like you do at the Seder. Instead, they're drinking whatever they want. So people um, ended up, and this is part of, of this Rava statement, people ended up celebrating by drinking. Because after all, wine makes the heart of the, of the person happy. So hard you know, spirits became an essential you know, ingredient in celebrating Purim. But then the question is, you know, like, like all the liquor and beer companies, please drink our product, but drink responsibly, right? So uh, um, how, do you, how do you do that balancing act? How do you, how do you balance out between uh, really enjoying uh, drinking, uh, drinking and drinking together? And at the same time, what, what happens, uh, um, you know, is there such a thing as drinking too much? Yeah, Jen. Uh, I, I was under the impression from what we were just reading that they didn't want us to drink responsibly. So that's where Rava comes in, right? Rava comes in with this statement. Now, that was all pre, a preliminary intro to reading Rava's statement. Let's read it one more time. Beryl, you got it? Okay, where am I reading? <laughs> Rava said, the next to last Rava paragraph. Said, one is obligated to become intoxicated with wine on Purim until one does not know the difference between cursed is Haman and blessed is Mordecai. Okay, so there are two notes here. Um, but yes, on, on, on the face of it, um, what Rabbi is saying is you're, this is, a, this is you're obligated to, to, to go blotto. Right to actually drink yourself to 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 oblivion, so that you can't tell the difference between Mordechai and Haman. Um, this is, um, you know, a, a uh, in it on the face of it, an encouragement for people to drink themselves, you know, uh, silly. Um, and uh, many people took it that way over over the, over the historical uh, development of of reading these laws, as we'll see in the next. Uh, um, the next uh, notes, um, other people said that cannot be. And we'll see that, uh, um, that this, um, there are some cautionary tales that the Talmud will tell us. So first read note nine, please. The pivotal events of the miracle of Purim, Vashti's downfall, Esther won, Esther's coronation, Haman's execution, all occurred during a feast of wine. Therefore, to commemorate the miracle, we drink wine on Purim. Okay, so in other words, it's not just to be happy. Wine is a, is a great, uh, um, you know, uh, pepper upper of people's spirits, but we notice that there are actually elements in the story. There are feasts throughout the story where drinking is very important. We're introduced at the very, very first verses of the Megillah, we have, there was a king, Achashvero, she was a king over a whole empire, and he decided to make a, a what do you call it, to make a feast, a party, kadat and everybody could drink as much as they wanted, right? There, there were no uh, um, minimums or maximums. So, um, and in fact, we read uh, that they drank, um, that they drank out of vessels and we, we sing that, that phrase with the mournful uh, tune of Eicha because according to the Midrash, the, the vessels to drink the wine were the vessels that were stolen from the temple, from the first temple. So uh, um, this is uh, um, the connection that's seen there. Um, so now we see that what Rav is saying, why is it an obligation? It's an obligation to drink because this is a little bit of what we do on, for instance, on Pesach or on Sukkot. We relive what the holiday is commemorating, right? So we, we, uh, we, we uh, play it out. So here Rav says, that's what you have to do here. You have to play it out by drinking wine. Okay, how much? So he says, so that you can't make any distinction between cursed is Haman, Arur Haman, and Baruch Mordechai. Um, 
Okay, note 10, please. These words are from a prayer cited in the Yerushalami. Cursed is Haman, blessed is Mordecai, cursed is Zeresh, blessed is Esther. Cursed are all the wicked, blessed are all the Jews. Okay, this, is, this, this prayer, we have it in a slightly different form in a prayer, a song, a prayer called Shoshana Yaakov. Shoshana Yaakov, Tzala, Aror Haman, Asher B'Kesh, Liavdi, Baruch Mordechai. So we have, the, all of this is in one of the traditional songs that we have uh, sung um, after the Megillah reading. So, okay, Except go ahead. I know a different tune. <laughs> What's your tune? Shoshanat Yaakov. Right. That's the one I learned. That's the one. And there are other tunes as well. There are many, many, many tunes. So um, good. Okay. Rava. Rava rules that one must become intoxicated with wine until one is unable to recite this prayer with clarity. Ah, so now we have already one of the pushback uh, um, uh, responses. It doesn't mean that you really cognitively can't tell the difference between good and evil. You can't tell the difference between a good person like Mordechai and a bad person like Haman. This is, you know, saying, wow, that would be horrible. Rather, what he says is quoting the prayer. He says, you should drink to the point where you would slur the words. Oh, you, won't, you don't know how to sing that, that song properly. But that's not the same thing as absolutely losing your sense of, uh, of uh, good and evil, right? So this is a, a kind of a, a hesitation and a, and a mitigation of, of uh, what Rava seems to be saying in a straightforward way. Okay, others? Others explain that Rava referred to a poem, the refrain of which alternated between cursed is Haman and blessed is Mordecai. One person would chant the poem and after each line, others would respond with the appropriate refrain. On Purim, one must become so drunk that one does not know which refrain to recite. Okay. Many other explanations are offered by the commentators. This is a, you know, very similar, um, but it's talking about the fact that you just sort of get all bollocked up, right? You get, you get mixed up in the song. You're not, you, you lose track of, uh, of which refrain you're supposed to sing when, as opposed to that you personally you know, can't get the words out of your mouth. Um, and that would be probably a little less intoxication than, uh, uh, than the first example. But again, both of them are, are, are moving away from the, uh, um, you know, from the really you know, extreme uh, statement that Rava seems to be saying. Okay, last, last few paragraphs. Many other explanations are offered by commentaries. According to some authorities, one indeed should drink wine on Purim to this point of intoxication. However, Others explain that re the requirement is merely to drink more than one usually does, and one reaches the state of not knowing the difference between cursed is Haman and blessed is Mordecai by falling asleep from the effects of the wine. Ah, so how do you get yourself, how do you get to oblivion? How do you get to the point where you can't tell the difference? When you're sleeping, right? So, so uh, forget about being conscious. Drink, you know, a couple of uh, a, cup, a couple of uh, cups of, of wine so that you start feeling nice and a little, you know, drowsy, and and enjoy that sweet sleep, and avoid the whole problem of the of the of the, the conflict between good and evil, which is so much a part of our uh, of our real world. Um, Purim is a carnival type of uh, celebration, and it celebrates the victory of good over evil, but it recognizes how tenuous and how tricky uh, the conflict can be. And that, you know, it could have gone the other way. It could have absolutely gone the other way. And that's a, that's a very scary thought. So how do you get out of that? How do you, how, do you, how do you not get depressed by that? The answer is 
take a couple of shots and go to sleep. That's that's the rereading that they have um, to editorialize a little bit. Um, now that we're at post-election, um, so yes, um, you know, uh, uh, Joseph Biden is is the, the president-elect, no question about it. Um, but on the other hand, if you look at how how fragile that victory uh, really was, and how much it still is up in the air about what the victory is actually going to be able to accomplish, you can get very very upset. You can get very very concerned about what the 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 ongoing uh, uh, you know situation uh, will become. So on Purim, you're supposed to forget about that. Forget about worrying about the ongoing problem. Just be happy. So here's one way to do it. Um, just you know, just like today, the mitzvah would be: don't read the New York Times on Purim. That would be uh, one way to to stay happy. Okay, and finally, Rabbi Ephraim. Uh, Ephraim pr proves from the Gemara below that in fact it is wrong to become intoxicated. Intoxicated. Period. It's wrong to become intoxicated. So right now we have Rava's statement, and as we will see now from the rest of the of the continuation of the Gemara, this statement may not actually stand. It sounds like it's authoritative. Rava is one of the great authorities of of the Babylonian Talmud. Rava, by the way, is the uh, um, the good buddy of Abaye. When uh, when uh, Abaye became a major sage, Rava was his um, his chief uh, um, interlocutor, right? So it was like Hillel and Shammai, Abaye and Rava, Rav and Shmuel. There are these like uh, Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish. There are these pairs of, of sages that are constantly talking to each other, disagreeing with each other, learning from each other. So here is Rava. Rava is the major sage of his time. So we would take what he says very seriously. But now Rabbeinu Ephraim says, not so fast. Let's look at the rest of the Gemara and let's see what the rest of the Gemara teaches us. Okay, so now we go back to the Gemara. The Gemara cites a related incident. The Gemara cites a related incident. Rabba and Rab Zira had the Purim feast together. They became intoxicated. Around 7B2. Go ahead. Rabba arose and slew Rav Zera. The next day, Rabba prayed for mercy on Rav Zera's behalf and revived him. The following year, Rabba asked Rav Zera, let master come and we will have the Purim feast together. Rav Zera answered him, not every time does a miracle occur. Okay, to put it mildly. Wow. All right, so we have this little miracle story. Um, and uh, this is what Rabbi Nehemiah Ephraim is, is referring to. According to this story, what starts out as just a happy-go-lucky party ends in tragedy, right? They drink so much that it gets rowdy and nobody knows what they're doing. And literally, Rabba, who is a great, great sage, doesn't know the difference between murderous uh, Haman and, uh, and, and righteous Mordechai. And it comes somehow or other, they don't tell us how it happens, but he ends up killing Rav Zera in his drunken uh, uh, mania. And he sobers up the next day and he prays to God and Rav Zera comes back to life. Okay, so, so that's the miracle that thankfully uh, a, a, a sage like, like, like Rabba was able to, to pull off. And then of course, when Rabba says to his good friend Rav Zera the following year, oh, let's have Purim Suda again together. And Rav Zera says, no thanks, no thanks. One miracle is enough. I don't, I don't wanna have to try to come back to life again. You know, let's 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 call it quits here. So uh, thanks, but no thanks. 
So that's a it's a story. It's a, it's a it's a jokey kind of story. Um, it's got a little edge to it, and actually, it's got a scary edge to it. Um, and this, of course, is you know touches precisely on that that uh, you know that balancing point about what what does it mean to to drink uh, and to drink to excess. Josie, what what? Is the custom though today? Are there communities in which it really is encouraged that people drink until they fall down and can't function? So actually, I when I first came to Shomre, there was a custom to have liquor at the back of the sanctuary on Purim night, ah. and uh, I abolished that custom, uh, much to the chagrin of a number of of people. And I said, look, if you want to have uh, um, liquor, I can't stop you. It's not going to be in the sanctuary. This is not a holy activity. Um, they moved it. Remember when there used to be a piano in the corner of the social hall? So that became the bar. Um, but uh, um, people challenged me and said, what are you talking about, Rabbi? This is like a time-honored custom. That's the whole point. We love to do this. And of course, by extension and by wrong extension, this became a custom on Simchas Torah also. The Simchas Torah also became a, a time when people uh, love to, you know, to, to, to drink a lot um, because they think that that's what it means to be happy. Um, in Purim, there's an excuse. In Simchas Torah, there's no excuse. But anyway, they, were, they challenged me and they said, what's going on here? What do you think you're doing? This is your, your uh, you know, you're taking away uh, a mitzvah that we have. And my response was and is um, that this, you know, whatever once upon a time, you know, it's, it's nice that, you know, we, we pick and choose. We do a little cherry picking about which customs we think are really wonderful and which customs we, we decide are, uh, are anachronistic and no longer should be, should be followed, um, depending on, on, you know, on how it serves our needs. But, um, you know, I said, look, even in the most pious communities today, there is an awakening to the super, super difficult problem of, uh, of alcoholism and of the dangers of, uh, of drinking to excess that become real problems. Um, and using religion as the kind of a cover for it is, is a, a known phenomenon. There are, there are you know, things called Kiddush clubs, um, where, where Kiddush uh, is the excuse for, uh, you know, for having a lot of drinks. And uh, um, many, many uh, uh, communities have tried to put an end to this and have tried to restore the idea that it's one thing to enjoy uh, a good drink and to be happy, you know, with, with the effect of it and, and, and so on. But it's another thing to, to you know, create a culture which will draw some people, maybe not you and not me, of course, we're immune, but it will draw some people into very uh, uh, sad situations. Um, and uh, um, what's our responsibility to all those people? There's, there's a, uh, a, a, you know, a, a law in, in, in the Torah of uh, the Nazir, the Nazarite. A Nazarite is a person who voluntarily gives up drinking out, uh, you know, grape products, alcohol. So they do that for whatever reasons, not important. But then the rabbi said, it says in the Torah also, you cannot put a stumbling block before the blind. You're not allowed to put somebody in a situation where they may be tempted to do what's not good for them, what's dangerous for them. So a person who can't see, don't trip them, don't put the, 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 you know, the thing there that they can trip over and get hurt. So they said, this applies as well to a Nazir. Don't offer a cup of wine to a person who can't drink. And this applies today to, uh, you know, to alcoholics as well. I have uh, two very dear friends who are recovering alcoholics. And, uh, you know, when, you know, I never, never, you know, put wine on the table when they're around. 
you know, not because I think that they may even drink it, but simply because that don't even go there. So there are, um, you know, psychologically, there's no, there's no reason to be oblivious. And then of course, you know, for friends enough, no, I am fine. I'm happy. I can handle it. You go drink your one. I don't want to stop you. You know, there's complications, but you need to be conscious of it. You need to be aware of it. So that awareness is not as a, as a, as a phenomenon about drunkenness in general was not as sharp as it is today. Uh, once upon a time, we had a, uh, a very uh, uh, arrogant, self-satisfied idea that Jews are not alcoholics, right? There, there, there's a, uh, there was a, uh, uh, a saying, shikar is a goy, right? You know, it's non-Jews who drink too much. They become drunk, but we don't become drunk. Um, and there were all kinds of explanations. Well, after all, because look, we make Kiddush, so we've normalized it, we've, we've sanctified it. Um, but guess what? You know, if, if, if you prick us, do we not bleed? Uh, we're just as human as everybody else. So in, in uh, contemporary society, there once upon a time was a difference uh, percentage-wise between alcoholics who were Jewish and not. There's no difference anymore. Um, and we need to be very, very sensitive to that problem and not use uh, pseudo religiosity as a uh, as a way to uh, uh, excuse uh, irresponsible behavior. That's where I come out. But yes, there are places where a lot of drinking happens, and they and they think it's it's fine, and they think that uh, you know clearly. You know, I'm out to destroy Judaism, and and they know what's better. And uh, after all, a party is a party. Don't be a party pooper. So uh, these are these are uh, you know struggles that every every person uh, has to balance out. I want to editorialize again before, and then other people can say how much. And that's that lifnei iver loti tein mikshol. Don't put a stumbling block before the uh, um, the blind. Don't put temptation in front of somebody uh, who may then uh, decide to do that. Um, in today's world of pandemic, how much is risk-taking uh, to be left to each person's discretion? And how much do we have a responsibility as a society to minimize the opportunities for people to take risks? because it's not only about hurting yourself, of course, but it's hurting somebody else. Rubber gets drunk. He wakes up the next day, he just has a hangover. But meanwhile, he killed somebody. So uh, um, he, uh, uh, you know, the danger is not just to yourself. I will decide whether I'm gonna drink or not. You know, that, that's the whole business about designated drivers, get somebody you know, to, to give up for the sake of everybody else. Um, but in our society as well, how much do we say, it's not up to you. This is, and in America, this of course is one of the key issues. As a as a, as a as a culture, we so 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 celebrate individual freedom that we see wearing a mask as as torture, as being some kind of like communist uh, uh, authoritarian uh, uh, imposition on our freedom. In certain states, this, I'm not making it up. This is what you know. This is this is what's going on today. So so how do you how do you balance individual discretion with, you know, uh, thinking about, about the safety of everybody. Sylvia. Couldn't agree with you more. I am on. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more on everything you've said. And, and uh, certainly this last little bit about Rabbi killing someone is the best argument you can have for mask wearing. Uh, now to go back to something much minor, a little Shomre history. I seem to recall that on um, Purim, people were asked to bring hard liquor in and it was put in the front of the synagogue. Now it happens to be something I don't like, so I don't ever have anything to do with it. But where did we jump? Question one is where did we jump from wine to hard liquor and why? Wine is sanctified, hard liquor as I understand it is a different animal. It doesn't come from grapes. Uh, and then a minor question is where did we get Halloween into uh, <laughs> into Purim. How did that happen? So, uh, the two, well, with regard to the wine and the hard liquor, 
it's what's called a slippery slope. And it's not about sanctification. As I said, the wine that you're drinking on Purim is actually to give you the buzz, to give you that, to make you feel good. So why should I use, you know, low grade, you know, uh, uh, happiness inducing stuff when I can use, you know, much more uh, uh, effective stuff. Oh, so we can have special Purim brownies then. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, um, that Gertrude Stein, that's how she celebrated Purim, right? You know, uh, Alice, Purim tomorrow, make some of those brownies. So, uh, um, but uh, um, the, the uh, yeah, so the idea is really much looking for, you know, uh, the stuff that's going to make you, um, you know, lose it. And uh, hard liquor does it better than wine for some people, I guess. Um, and I don't remember it being in the front, but uh, so look, there's been a little bit of a, of a history as you, as you filled in about, about uh, how this goes on. And uh, you know, now we're at where we're at. Um, who else wanted to say something? You know, I want to know about, I want to know how Halloween. Oh, about, about, about uh, uh, costumes. So costumes, we'll get to costumes. Costumes is, is um, a little bit of, of a kind of a carnival, a little bit of the, uh, um, the, the reenactment, for instance, of Mordechai wearing the costume of the king, right? He's led through the, uh, uh, the city of Shushan by Haman. That's one of Haman's comeuppances is uh, that uh, he gets dressed up in that costume. Esther hides her identity as a Jew at the beginning so that she can you know, you know, uh, uh, win the beauty contest. So all of this idea about, about uh, costumes and about hiding one's identity or, or uh, you know, using some other kind of uh, means of, of uh, covering yourself up, that's also an essential part of Purim. But yes, there's an influence from the outside cultures as well. Um, there's a, a classic uh, uh, anthropology book, The Golden Bough, um, which actually de deals directly with Purims that are not Purim. You know, how other cultures have things that are similar to Purim. So uh, um, we learn from, from, from our cultures, our surrounding cultures as well. Yeah. All right, Jen and then Bill. Um, so as far as how do we get people to wear masks, like I feel like the way, I remember when I used to work in children's shoes, all the Orthodox Jewish boys used to come in to Nordstrom. We had a large, large Orthodox community that shopped there. But their kippahs always had like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or the New York Yankees or they had uh, Naruto or they had like cool anime stuff or whatever going on. Well, we, we do the same thing with masks. I mean, I know that from my own experience that kids who watch anime and read manga already are cool with masks because they see all their favorite characters wearing masks in Asia. It's no big deal. But I mean, if once you have like Queen Elizabeth walking around with a different mask for each outfit, then, you know, it, once you can normalize it that way, I mean, just play on that, make it fashionable. The more TV shows that show masks as a normal thing, the more the queen and you know, all of them wear masks and et cetera, then uh, the easier it gets to just become a normalized thing. I'm glad you said the queen and not the president. Um, so uh, the president also, but I, I feel like the queen's outfits have a little more cachet. In, like, <laughs> you're, you're an English history buff. Well, that's true. It's true. So, so that's, but you know, I wish you would, I wish that it was as easy as what you said, because look, that's unfortunately this vast, divide that we have in our country with all these states and governors and people who should know better and who are saying no. Uh, Bill and then and then Gerald. Yeah, two things, Rabbi. <clears throat> the first is, uh, Sylvia is, is right. Before you came, uh, liquor, hard liquor bottles, more than more than one, like five or six, were lined up at the edge of the bima, usually on the on the left hand side. And on Purim, in particular, when different people finished reading the M M Megillah, they would go and take and take a, a slug of the liquor. On Simchas Torah, the same thing. When people read, I, I forget exactly which part of the of the service people took a turn reading one one of the one of the verses. After they finished, they would go up and take a and, and take a drink. The second thing is that, that that practice and the excesses of it were one of the things I think that's responsible for my distaste for Simchat Torah. I've loathed it from the from the from the very get-go. I associated it not just with drinking. Drinking is I have no problem of no problem with that, but with excessive drinking where people would get stupid 
from, from drinking this stuff. And it was so distasteful that I gave up going to Simcha's Torah. And I continue that practice today. Purim, I don't remember to tell you the truth, a lot of the, the liquor, maybe it was out, it was outside even before for your time. So I don't have, I don't have the, those kind of distasteful feelings about Purim. In fact, I rather, I rather like it. But for Simcha's Torah, my, my loathing of that aspect of it continues even to this day. Well, I'm, I'm sorry that it had that effect on you because what you're doing is you're letting people that are abusing uh, a holiday ruin the holiday for you and take the, take away the good stuff of the holiday. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, that's, that's very unfortunate and, you know, you, you'll deal with it however you want to deal with it. But um, that's not what Purim, it's not what, it's not what Simcha Torah is all about. And there is, um, in my experience at Shomre, both with Purim and with Simcha Torah, that uh, issue has uh, been mitigated to, to a, a great degree. Um, and uh, I, I, uh, I invite you when you can to, you know, to check it out. I'm taking it under, under advisement every under year. Advisement. God willing, next week, next year, maybe we'll be able to dance together again. Inshallah. All right. Anybody else? Yes, Sylvia. One last comment. It, it, seems, it, it seems to me that the difference between good and bad evil and good is never seen uh, when you're drunk. And if you want to see the difference between good and bad, why would you want people to get to the point where they can't see the difference? Right, so this is, that's, that's an important point. This whole thing that what, what is, is there actually some kind of uh, deeper meaning to what Rava is saying? about this, this uh, uh, blurry, blurrying, blurring the line. See, I must be drunk. I can't even say this stuff out clearly. Um, between good and evil. What's, what's the point of that? It sounds very postmodern, to put a different way of, of, of saying what, you, what you're saying. Um, is there really some kind of, uh, um, you know, message like that? Um, I tried to touch on that a little bit by saying that it's, it's very, the, the Purim story, in when you take away, when you strip away the fun part of it, is a very scary and dark story. And that's the part that um, sometimes that most people would just like to avoid. Most people don't want to deal with that. And in, in look, in people's troubles uh, in general, um, you know, what, who am I to, to pontificate about this? But a lot of drinking is about forgetting, uh, you know, forgetting stuff that otherwise, if you think about it, make you feel very uncomfortable, sad, anxious, um, you know, whatever. Um, confronting very hard situations of hard, hard factors in the world or in your life, how you take it, and and drinking takes it away, so um, temporarily. But uh, um, so that's the thing: is 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 you know, is there something? actually very serious about what Rubba is saying here, that at least momentarily, let's give outlet to that need that we have to forget about how tricky it is to, to, uh, uh, you know, to engage in this fight. Um, let, me put the, let me put the trickiness in a different way. It's not just tricky that good should prevail. You know, that a lot of times good does not prevail. Sometimes we fight for good and we end up becoming bad because we fight in that, you know, in a, in a way that turns us into our, our enemy, um, you know, from, from a, uh, you know, a, a, a certain perspective was, was, you know, are the crusades, you know, a holy war or a crusades an abomination, you know, where, where was the inquisition, you know, a, a struggle on behalf of, of God's glory or was it, or was it, a, you know, an obscenity? Um, so, we take, um, we take religion and we take goodness. Look at communism. Communism has, in my, in my view, it's got under its, you know, many basically very moral and good ideas. You know, uh, Marx, anti-Semite, self-hating Jew that he was, um, he, he really was appalled when other people weren't. He was appalled by the suffering of, of too, many, too many human beings. And he was trying to solve that. What he ended up setting into motion 
was a system that created, you know, just as much, if not more. So, so that it's very tricky. We spend a lot of time on this in Zohar. Yeah, Stuart. Oh, yeah, just quickly. Um, I, I, I like a, a nice glass of wine as much as anyone. I've always found the prospect of drinking four glasses of wine at the Passover Seder a challenge. Um, it's, uh, that's quite a lot of wine to drink. Well, you and, don't have to finish all four. You can, you can take a sip. You, pour, you, you don't have to finish it to the bottom. Okay. It just means that you refresh your glass four times. Okay, I always understood it to be that you're supposed to drink four glasses. Good, good to know. How big right. is that glass though? <laughs> right, right, right. So, all right, Geraldine. Just to go back to what um, Jennifer said um, my about the masks, my little three-year-old niece has been um, wearing, that's the only thing that she knows when she goes out. So her big thing when she gets dressed in the morning is to match her mask to her outfit. And she enjoys doing that. And she keeps it on and she knows there's a reason for it. So it's whatever you teach the children to do, right. they will do the right way. Right. So, and you can equally teach the child. You see all those people with masks, they're out to get you. And, and they're trying to take away your enjoyment of life. You can teach, you know, you can teach either way. Yeah. You can teach either way. Right. Well, I, just, just a quickie on the mask. I compare getting people to wear masks like seatbelts. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember when nobody right. used seatbelts and then it was mandated. Nobody used it. And then they put in beepers in case you didn't have it on. And today we get in the car and we don't have a seatbelt on. We feel something's very strange. Right. So, yeah, people I've, I've seen, I haven't read into this stuff, but I've seen that people have tried to, Say maybe we can learn from that, have that process, how to get it better in the in in society. Look, I hope we do because we all have a great stake in that. Um, the problem, you know, the one little obvious problem is car crashes are obvious, and people getting sick from COVID is not obvious. You know, ah, oh, they got sick because of something else. So who says it was because of that? And who says it was because of that? You know, uh, um, there's there's a you know a a simplicity to the to the uh, to the you know seatbelt issue that people uh, couldn't deny that they're so much more uh, willing to deny when it comes to unseen viruses. All right, we're going to stop here, uh, and I want to wish everybody uh, a wonderful Thanksgiving. Happy uh, Thanksgiving, keep, everybody. Eat Happy your turkey responsibly. Okay, please. And uh, enjoy it in whatever way that you can, and uh, let everything be a lot better for next year. Okay. Stay safe. Bye bye. Oh, now I got it. Right, have a good week. Bye bye. Have a good week, everybody. Stay safe. Right. Amen. Stop. Stop.